Why is your garden not producing? Well, that is the big question, and the answer is cultivation. I'm Petrina with Homegrown Florida, and today we're going to be talking all about cultivation. And cultivation is just how are you taking care of the plants once they're in the ground. I put out a request on social media and YouTube asking for all of you guys' questions, and you came back with a ton and there are six areas that i wanted to focus on when it comes to cultivation this is going to be sun exposure watering pest management disease management and then of course soil and fertilizer which is usually the number one question i get when i'm doing my garden consultations my one-on-ones that is probably the biggest question how do you feed the soil to feed the plant so we're going to get into all of that right now so the first question I got was from Linda and Janice. They both had kind of similar questions around how do you make sure that you have the right sun placement? Is it a certain area of your yard? Is How do you monitor the sun throughout your garden? I have found that in my garden, and every garden is unique, but in mine, the southeast corner of my yard is the best because it provides sun from about seven or eight o'clock to about two o'clock. And that is like the perfect amount of sun for Florida. And it's morning sun because it's on the east side. Now the northeast side is pretty decent too. It has a bit more of a dapple light because of where the sun sits in the sky, but still pretty good. The northwest side of my yard is also pretty decent. Once again, it's on that north side, so it's got that dapple light. The worst side of my yard is the southwest. And for me, it's probably a different reason than for most other gardens. For me, it's because I have a huge amount of things that are casting a ton of shade. I have a line of trees behind my house. I have a six foot privacy fence and I have a shed. And all of that is in that area causing a significant amount of shade. And so that section of my yard doesn't get very much um, light at all. But in your garden, if you don't have all of those things casting shade, that might actually be the worst part of your garden for a different reason. And that's actually because it will get too much sun, <laughs> too much intense afternoon sun. And that is something that you have to be careful of. The morning sun is almost always a better intensity because the plants are not super stressed by the, uh, you know, by the being in that hot sun all day long. Now, the way that you can track your sun movement you need to be doing this two times a year. So dead of winter, dead of summer. And the easiest way I have found to do it is take those four corners and take a picture. Start at 8 a.m. and every three to four hours, put a little alarm on your phone, <laughs> go out and take a picture of each four of those corners of your yard. And you'll be able to see where the sun is at the different hours of the day from 8 to 6 p.m. Is usually about it six or seven then you'll be able to track in winter and in summer where are the best spots where is it getting shade after 2 p.m where is it getting sun in the early morning and that's going to tell you exactly where you need to be because you need that six hours of sun and the best time is between eight and two and if that is not possible in your yard try to find a window that is as close to possible as that and you want at least six hours in an annual garden there are other plants that can live in more shade and fruit trees in my area they live on the west side which is strange because that's the side that doesn't do very well but they they sit above the fence line so they don't get as much shade as they would if they were below the fence line like your annual vegetables usually are the next section we're going to talk about is watering. I had good questions from Tammy and Ella. So Tammy asked, what's the best irrigation system? And Ella asked, how often do you water your plants? And she was specifically talking about seedlings because she had just watered them and wanted to know how long she needed to wait before watering them again because they felt a little moist. So let's start with Ella's since that's earlier in the life cycle of a plant. So Ella, depending on the type of soil you are using when you start your seeds will depend on how often you need to water them. I have found if you're starting with a seed starting mix that has perlite or coconut core in it, that stuff holds water <laughs> like really, really well so well that I water my seedlings and I usually don't touch them again until they sprout. Now, some seedlings like tomatoes and peppers take longer, but usually it's somewhere around five days that I will have to water them again. And you're looking for the top of that soil um, turns from that dark brown color to a lighter brown color. Now, if you are using regular potting mix, 
this is different. Regular potting mix has not as much peat moss or coconut core in it. Some varieties do, but most of them don't. And that is the stuff that really holds on to moisture. So if you're using a regular potting soil or garden mix or just soil from your yard, it's not gonna hold on to water as well. And so you are gonna have to be looking to water those probably about every two to three days, depending on heat and moisture. Like right now it's raining like crazy. It's been raining for three days and I'm so sick of it. <laughs> but for your seedlings, if you're using a potting mix, you're probably looking about two or three days. Now, Tammy was asking what's the best irrigation method. So let's talk about once your seedlings are grown up and they're out in your raised beds, your in ground or, or in your container, how often do you need to be watering them? Well, honestly, this is a really hard question to answer because every garden is different. You know, it, it depends. Are you using mulch? Um, do you have a soil base that has a lot of peat moss or coconut core in it? Or is it potting soil? Or is it compost? All of those different things are going to say how often you need to be watering it. Has it rained recently? Like right now, it's been raining for three days. I'm probably not going to have to water for a week <laughs> and it's nice and cool out. So the evaporation isn't occurring. The best way to know how often to water your particular garden is you need to do that finger poke test or use a moisture meter. A moisture meter is gonna tell you how moist the soil is down because it's not the top of the soil that you need to be concerned about. It's about two to three inches down. A moisture meter will go down that far, but your finger can also do two or three inches down and you can poke your finger and when you come up, if you have sticky, dirty, you know, it's wet, it, it'll feel moist, it'll stick to your skin and it will start to stain your fingers because your fingers kind of absorb water. If you see that, you don't need to water. So my suggestion is after you've watered, do the finger poke test or the moisture meter every day until you notice that that soil has dried out to the point that when you stick your finger in it and you come back out, it doesn't really have much stuck to your finger. Think of it like, you know, testing a cake or a cupcake and you use the toothpick and you stick the toothpick in. If your toothpick comes out with stuff stuck to it, you know it's not cooked on the inside. The same kind of holds true for the garden. If you stick your finger in and it comes back and it's not really holding on to anything, that's what tells you it's dry. Now Tammy was specifically asking about what is the best irrigation system and honestly any irrigation that waters your plants is, is the best system for you. But I have found a few that I like um, and ones that if I were to do my garden all over again, I would totally do this. Now drip irrigation is probably number one in the books, best one to do. It's because the way that it waters is through a drip, a small amount of water, or they have some drip irrigations. I think they're like little tiny sprays um, and they're just pointed directly at the ground. Those are best because they're not spraying the top of the plant, which helps with disease management and it's giving this water straight to that individual plant not having to water the entire bed. I personally have a micro sprayer system so when we got this house the sprinkler system was kind of messed up and so we had to have a company come out and redo all the sprinkler lines. When they came out to do that, I asked them, I told them that I was going to put garden beds up and they told me about micro sprayers and they actually have these hoses that run underground and connect to my sprinkler system that pop up into my beds. I poke holes in those hoses and attach my micro sprayers and that's how mine gets sprayed. This one is less than ideal because it does end up causing this mist spray across maybe about two feet of the bed and um, that kind of hurts the tomatoes and the peppers and some of the other plants that are prone to disease, cucumbers, squashes, really prone to disease. So I've been trying to grow more vertically rather than having to change out my system. And then one of my favorite ways, especially for beginners, is to get a timer and a soaker hose. <laughs> the simplest way to do this for the least expensive cost. So a soaker hose is just a hose that has little, um, little holes, little pin pricks in it, and it kind of just sends off a, a very tiny spray amount of water, and usually it's focused downwards to the ground. 
and then a timer, you connect that soaker hose to another hose that connects to your faucet outside. And then that faucet has a timer. And usually these timers are battery operated. Sometimes you can find solar ones. It doesn't have to be super expensive. Um, most of these are very inexpensive. You can find them on Amazon. I have some down in my Amazon store that you can check out. The link is in the description. But these are probably the most simplest way. You're screwing something to a faucet, you're screwing something to a hose, and then a hose to a soaker hose, depending on how far away your faucet is from your, from your garden. And then you just set the timer. It is so easy. <laughs> and usually watering is gonna be one of those first things that you're gonna wanna automate because it is so time intensive. Although I know there's many of you that really find it therapeutic to go out and hand water your garden. By all means, if you enjoy that, absolutely do that. Now the next section we're gonna be talking about is mulch and it kind of goes with watering because mulch feeds the soil but it also keeps moisture down into the ground. So the first question came from Master Sergeant Boone and he was asking about how mulch works. Does it, you know, he can understand using it during the winter because it will keep the roots warmer, which is a lot of what our Northern friends do. But his question was around, you know, does it heat up the beds during summer? And actually it's the opposite. It cools the bed down. <laughs> I know this seems like really counterintuitive because mulch does both warming and cooling. What mulch is doing is it's an insulator. So the ground below our feet tends to maintain a certain temperature the further you go down. That's why you got root cellars and things like that. Even in cold climates, like super cold climates, a root cellar will maintain a 40 to 50 degree temperature. Well, the same holds true because the ground below our feet maintains a certain temperature, but the first, you know, six feet of it or something like that will fluctuate depending on the temperatures outside. When you mulch and you mulch heavy during the winter, it keeps the ground from freezing. That's what our Northern friends deal with. But we mulch usually for a different reason, and that is to keep the ground cool. <laughs> During summer, those top few feet of the ground heat up extremely fast. And that's actually what's bothering your plants more than the actual sun beating down on the leaves. It's the heat that's happening to the roots. Believe it or not, your plants could live through summer if you're able to keep that soil cool enough, which tends to be quite hard when you get like really to those, you know, August temperatures. <laughs> but if you mulch super heavy and you mulch with really thick mulch, it will keep moisture in and moisture cools things down and it will keep the cool temperatures from the ground below coming up and keep that you know, garden soil to about the 70, you know, 80 degree range. So it actually is more of an insulator and it's holding the temperature of the ground. And mulch is like the best thing when it comes to watering your plants because it creates a skin over the top of your soil. The soil can hold its moisture rather than the sun beating down on the soil and the evaporation occurring. When evaporation occurs, it, it makes the plants dry out faster and it struggles with uptake of water. If you have that layer of mulch, and I'm talking when we get into summer, guys, that thick of mulch, it will keep the layers of that soil below it wet. <laughs> and I love my favorite mulch during the summer is going to be grass clippings but be careful, use the grass that doesn't have a lot of weed seeds to it. During the winter, I don't like to use grass clippings because it does hold on to water too well, <laughs> too well. And this winter, especially, I'm so glad I didn't use it because it seems like it has felt like I've gotten a lot more rain in my garden. So I'm glad I didn't do that. I switched over to wood chips and um, leaf litter, which is just dead leaves. And by doing that, it's not holding as bad of the moisture, but it is holding the moisture. Now, the next question comes from Kelly. How do you amend the beds with this mulch? Or how do you plant in a bed with mulch? Um, you, you literally just rake it. Um, you take a little rake or a little three pronged, I don't know what they're called, little, it's like a, it looks like a hoe kind of, but it has three prongs on it. And you pull that mulch back and then you amend the bed with whatever you're gonna use, bone meal, blood meal, whatever you're gonna use. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then you kind of massage it into the soil and then you break that mulch back over. 
that's how it's done. If you want to plant, especially during the summer, and you have, you know, four inches of mulch, you are going to pull the mulch away, just create like a hole, dig down, put your transplant in or your seed in. If you're doing a seed, you don't cover it back up with mulch. You leave the mulch away so that the seedling can sprout. And once it gets big enough to clear the mulch, that four inches, you'll push the mulch back over it. And then I think Akusha um, asked about weed-free pathways. Probably your best bet for a weed-free pathway is to use sheet mulching. And the best way to do this is to lay down um, cardboard, like your Amazon boxes, lay those down all around the area. And then you're going to get wood chips, as many wood chips as possible, large amounts. And you're going to lay that on top of, on top of the cardboard, you know, three, four, six inches deep. And that's going to kill everything underneath it. And it's going to have the wood mulch, which is not the best in growing environment for, you know, anything. Plants, seeds, really, a really thick wood mulch is going to create, um, you know, it's going to try to trap the nitrogen. And so plants don't do very well growing through it. The fourth area we're going to talk about is pests. And so we're going to start with Jay Holmes and Dr. Saad. And their question is squirrels. <laughs> oh, those guys are pesky. <laughs> the, air, the ways that I have found that have worked is number one, having a small dog or cat and letting them out into your garden area to chase things has been my biggest way of dealing with the squirrels. I have one dog, Chloe, that is just obsessed with chasing squirrels and that usually keeps them out of my yard because they never know when their dogs are in the yard. <laughs> Another way to handle this is to take your hair or your dog's hair like if you're brushing your dog's hair or ladies if you're using a hairbrush and you know your hairbrush ends up with a lot of hair in it um, take that hair and kind of spread it out through your garden. It transfers the scent of you or your dog out to the garden and it sometimes will scare away squirrels. Another way to get rid of squirrels is um, usually they're coming to your garden, not just because they're hungry, but because they're thirsty, um, especially in the summer when maybe the water sources have dried up or it's too hot. They're looking for an easy way to get water. So if you want to create a, a watering fountain or a bowl of water off and away from your garden, um, more than likely they will go for that. And you can entice them even more by adding a few peanuts in that area as well. Um, you will be feeding them, which is kind of a negative because you'll encourage them to go to that spot. But hopefully you're encouraging them to go over there and stay away from this area. And then last but not least, probably one of the biggest things that help my garden is a fence. And it, not just any fence, because a wood fence or a chain link fence, they can crawl up. But I have a vinyl privacy fence and they don't do very well at climbing that, but they do have a ton of trees to climb so they still get in my yard. So that's your, your best way. And then a blessed home asked about deer. Um, so I had to research this because I'm not really in an area that has a lot of deer. But um, from what I understand, deer is pretty difficult to keep out of a garden. They're just super attracted to the plants. <laughs> They're yummy. So fence is like the number one thing, but I think um, All Blessed Home or A Blessed Home was asking if you don't have a fence, what's your other option? You're going to have to create some kind of barrier. If you're not allowed to have a fence, are you allowed to have a temporary electric fence? Because that could work to keep them out. If that's not an option, if like no fencing whatsoever is an option, whether it's temporary or permanent, then you're going to have to create a barrier that they don't want to get through. And from what I understand in my research, deer don't like, you know, thorns, thickets, fuzzy things, you know, um, plants that create like fuzzy flowers or fuzzy leaves. Um, they don't really like that. They don't like to eat that. When they try to, you know, eat it down their throat, it, it gets scratchy and scrapey. Probably the thing that I think of in my garden that would have that effect would be my blackberries. I have blackberries and you can, mine are thornless, but you can absolutely find blackberry varieties that actually have thorns. Uh, lemon and lime trees, they grow fast and they have a lot of really bad thorns <laughs> that are uncomfortable to uh, be around. So creating a complete hedge of say some lemon trees and then some blackberries, they're going to chew the heck out of these things. But most of the time during the year, 
those plants aren't producing. They're only producing a couple times during the year. So you're not going to have to get in there and deal with them, but you're going to want to create like a patch that's difficult for them to get through. You can also try, I've heard of this with like very mild success, is, you know, creating a pathway that's difficult for them to walk on like shells or um, river rocks or something like that. Although they tend to get over that pretty fine. You can spray deer repellent, although I've heard that that isn't super effective either. The best way to keep the deer out is to create a barrier, whether that's a fence or whether that's using plants, that's going to be your best bet. Now, Tammy asked a question about intercropping and companion planting for pest reduction. I love to do this. I love intercropping. So there's certain plants that most pests don't like, and that's going to be your onions or your alliums. So garlic, onions, leeks, um, shallots, all that family. Most herbs, right? So oregano, parsley, dill, um, then your flowering herbs like borage, chamomile, those kinds of things. They don't like those types of things. So if you can plant those below the plants that have the big pest problem, that's going to be your best bet. And then there is one other type of plant that you can use, which are trap plants, right? So the two that come to mind are like marigolds and like a blue hubbard squash. Okay, so if you have a really bad problem with squash bugs, plant a blue hubbard squash away from the garden and that plant just like super attracts squash bugs. So you're not gonna get production off that plant, but hopefully it will draw those bugs over there to their favorite plant. The same goes for marigolds. If you have a really hard time with like spider mites or aphids or something like that, if you plant a bunch of marigolds, they will migrate over there because they love that plant so much. And hopefully that keeps them contained to that plant. And it's not going to look good. The plant's going to look terrible. You're not going to want to treat the plant. You're just going to want them to migrate over to that plant and eat that plant. And then I had a question from uh, Strovillian. I'm not sure. Um, asking about how I keep my brassicas so bug free. And he particularly had a problem with slugs. I have a very bad problem with slugs. Now, the plus side is that brassicas grow during the winter season. That is when you should be growing them. I know you tried to grow them during summer. It's not the right time. So when you grow them during the winter, slugs are not our slugs down here. I know that there's like slugs in the north that actually go out when it's cold, but ours tend to not move a lot when it gets cold. So if you grow them during the winter season, you don't have as many pest pressures. The slugs are actually down below the ground trying to keep warm and they don't really come up. Um, snails though, I do get a lot of snails, like little tiny snails, and they do actually chew the leaves. You're not noticing that in the videos because they chew the underside bottom leaves and you're looking at the top side leaves. So if we got in deep and, and looked underneath my leaves, you would notice that I have, I have snail damage under there. It's, it's really common and it really doesn't hurt the plant, so I just let them go. If you have a really bad slug problem and you're growing in the warmer season when they've come back up, don't leave garden debris because that's what they love to eat. They love cardboard and garden debris. So if you cut the leaves off your um, cabbage or whatever, don't leave it in your garden, but go and take it over to your compost pile. The less they have to eat, the less they'll want to stay. There are organic solutions like Sluggo and stuff like that that I have had mild success with, but honestly, the way that I got rid of mine is I actually kind of encouraged them to come to me. So I put down a piece of cardboard, I wet underneath the piece of cardboard, and at night, after it gets dark, I will lift that cardboard and use my flashlight, and I will find them, and I destroy them at that, at that moment. The next question I got was from Sandy. She wanted to talk trellises. She's having a hard time finding enough trellises for all her vining plants. And trust me, I feel you. So I will have a video coming out soon that'll talk about all the new trellises that I've built in my garden. And I'm absolutely in love with them. But there are a few that I suggest. So the arch trellis using T-posts and animal fencing or a cattle panel is like spot on one of the best trellises I have. Then I have an A-frame trellis that I really like. It, you know, kind of looks like this and it, it sits up in the, in the beds. It has like a netting. So it's not meant for like super heavy plants like squash, but it can help with like peas and cucumbers. Um, then I have panels. Instead of an arch, you can do a panel. And then probably the easiest, least expensive, less, uh, 
less effort is going to be using a tomato cage. And that's actually the trellis that I used for the longest period of time is I would get some tomato cages, I would put them in and I would grow cucumbers, peas, and everything else up that trellis. Doesn't really work for the big ones like watermelons, cantaloupes, you know, squash. Um, if you have any kind of fencing like a um, chain link fence, that's a good option. If you have a tree that those can call, crawl up, I did that with my palm tree. Um, they crawl up the palm tree. That is a really good option. Um, wood fencing, they can usually crawl up. Not the not necessarily the vinyl fencing, but the wood fencing that has some texture to it so it can crawl up. So those are all different ways that you can trellis or grow those plants vertically. The last area we're gonna talk about is soil and fertilizing. And I'm gonna start with intercropping and cover cropping okay so we had questions from i think it's linda's and living in the sunshine state and their questions were about that cover cropping and transition cover cropping and linda's wanted to know what you can cover crop at the different seasons so there's when i think of cover cropping i think of like two seasons right so there is warm and hot season crops you know, the hot season crops can grow during the warm season. And then you have cool season crops. We have a lot of hot season crops that you can use as a cover crop. Sun hemp is my favorite because it just has a high nitrogen fixing rate. But sun hemp is one. Cow peas, any kind of beans or peas work. Um, but uh, black eyed peas just grow really, really easy during the summer. So that's an easy one. I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this right. Sorghum. <laughs> Uh, millet, those are all good options. And I think marigolds is technically considered a cover crop as well. Clover and uh, fetch, like hairy fetch or whatever, those will actually grow in the winter. Now, I've never grown those because I don't usually cover crop during the winter. Um, that's my primary growing season, so I don't cover crop. I cover crop during the summer when I don't want to be out here. <laughs> and it grows all summer long, and then I cut it down and I work it into the beds. So that is my favorite cover crops and transitioning between cover crops. Um, so the way that I like to do it is during the winter, I'm growing my primary season, right? So I'm growing all of the cold season crops. And then as we move out of January into February and March, I'm growing my warm season crops. Um, and then once those plants start to die or they're starting to show serious stress or they're starting to show like really bad pest activity, I'll cut them down at the roots and then I'll plant my cover crop. For me, I like sun hemp or cow peas. Those are my two favorites. So I'll plant those, they'll sprout. And as they grow, when they get, I don't know, about three, four feet tall, I will cut the tops off of them, put them into a bed and then let them regrow, cut the tops off, put them in the bed. And I just keep doing that over and over and over through the whole summer. Now your goal is with um, cow peas and I guess the sun hemp is not to allow them to flower. Keep cutting them back so that they don't flower. Because once they start flowering, they're gonna take that nitrogen and, and put it into producing the peas or the seeds for the sun hemp. So if you can keep it from flowering, cut it down and just keep cutting it down. If you cut it down and it like immediately goes to flower again, cut the whole thing at the base, chop it up, throw it in your garden bed, and then plant another round of cow peas or sun hemp or whatever it is that you wanna use for a cover crop. As far as intercropping goes, um, I like intercropping. I like mixing vegetables together. So right now I'm growing, even though they're out of season, I am growing radishes underneath what will be the area where I have my cantaloupes and my tomatoes because it helps bring down the leaf foot bugs. They don't seem to like radishes. And, and my radishes are not gonna produce radishes. <laughs> They're just gonna produce plants because it's too hot for them to produce radishes, but the radishes help with the bug activity. So um, it's, it's a companion plant. I like to intercrop those. Um, while we still have our onions, I like to intercrop those, or you can use green onions, which pretty much grow year round here in Florida, summer, winter, spring, whatever. It doesn't matter. They grow all the time and they are a great plant to put around plants that tend to have more aphid issues. So I will wrap a plant with, you know, green onions 
and you know I may not eat all those green onions because it's a lot of green onions I grow in my garden because of this um, you don't have to necessarily eat the companion plant if you don't want to or it doesn't even need to produce if you don't want it to uh, what you want it to do is intercrop around the plant so it creates diversity and it's also either a trap plant to bring the pests to stay there and not climb up your tomato plant or it repels the pest and kind of pushes them away I think that a lot of us look at like gardens on the internet and they have the rows and the pathways in between them and they're all you know one plant and you think that you have to to do it that way and that's not the case at all um, mixing them up is an excellent way now I've kind of gotten to a point in my gardening life where I do blocks so I'll have a block of onions and then I'll have a block of tomatoes and then I'll have a block of carrots and then I, I kind of do it that way and the main reason for that is because I have found that if it is a crop that I am trying to eat uh, they tend to shade each other out. But if it's a crop that you're not intending to eat, you're planning to use it solely for its companion benefits for pest management, um, it, you don't have to worry about doing the blocks. You just wrap your plant around it. Okay, the next section is going to be about compost, which is a type of fertilizer amendment in the garden. It's a way to feed your plants. So I had a few questions. Um, the first one was from Donna, how do you make your own soil? I make my soil by using my compost and then I'll mix it with something like peat moss or coconut core to create you know a mix and then I usually add sand or perlite you can use our own sand that we have here as soil <laughs> our soil is very very sandy so mixing in some native soil that works really well and that will make up your your soil Nancy asks can you compost in containers and do you need to add perlite I actually did this this season and that is probably the best tomatoes I've ever grown in a container. So I started the bottom of the container with just some old soil, like stuff that I had used in previous uh, containers. Then I had um, pretty much plant debris, so chopped up plants that had died, um, chopped up wood, leaves, and probably about three quarters of that pot had that stuff that had not broken down and I added to that some of my kitchen scraps and it is now composting in place and then on top of that I put good soil good soil um, that is loose it has perlite and things like that mixed in on the top as those plants start out they start out in the good soil and they they grow and then as they grow their roots grow down into that compost in place area and it starts to bring in bugs and pests and things like that and the plants you know and they break down that stuff now I have not tipped out those um, plants yet because they are still alive and thriving but when I do I'm really curious how much of it is going to be you know composted or is it going to still be non-composted you know like is am I going to still find like pieces of kitchen scraps in there so I'm very curious about that so yes, you can absolutely compost in place. And yes, you want to add perlite, but you want to add perlite not necessarily to the compost in place part, but the top part where your plants are going to grow while they're getting big. Carolyn asked, um, how do you make your own fertilizer? Well, compost is like the best way, I think, personally. Compost just adds so much nutrients and you are basically getting all the ingredients for compost for free. This is grass clippings. You know, just put the bag on your lawnmower. Um, leaves, if you're raking leaves from your yards because they fell during fall, you put that in your compost. If you have, I have a home wood chipper, um, so I chip up wood and I put that in my compost. Uh, my paper towel rolls, newspaper, um, shredded up paper of all that junk mail that I get, um, and then food scraps. Uh, if you have chickens, you can put the chicken litter or the chicken manure into that as well. You're just basically creating this giant pile of stuff and it really is just garbage <laughs> and every once in a while you turn that compost pile to get aeration so that it can breathe and you want to keep it somewhat moist so if you can do compost whether it's in a tumbler or in a pile that is going to be the best way to fertilize your plants it adds an amount of nutrition that is honestly really intense and really cool the other way that i make my own <laughs> is urine I do use uh, human urine in my garden. My husband is our contributor. And that is something that has a lot of nitrogen, although it has some phosphorus and potassium as well, but it is very high in nitrogen. So you cut it with water. You take the urine and you, you cut it 
five or 10 to one parts water to urine. There's a lot of articles out there if you want to research it yourself, but there's a lot of articles out there that say that um, you need to age the urine a certain period of time. You want to make sure that nobody has any kind of infections that is contributing to it. And you want to make sure that um, you're using it from somebody who doesn't take medication. There are some things that you need to think about if you are going to use human, <laughs> human urine. Um, but that is another way. Wood ash from fires and stuff like that. If you put out a lot of fires on your yard, you can use wood ash and that is a good source of, um, I think it's phosphorus. Yeah, I think it's phosphorus. Um, and then, you know, going and getting seaweed from the beach is another way to create your own fertilizer. Those are all ways to do it. Our Bert asked, you know, basically all the different fertilizers that I use and how often I use them. So let's break it into types, right? So we got leafy greens, you got root crops, and you got fruiting plants. And then you have fruit trees, okay? So actually it's four types. So leafy greens, you want a high nitrogen feed. So usually what I do to prepare a bed that I know that I'm going to have like a lot of brassicas and lettuce and stuff like that in is I will put down blood meal. Blood meal has a lot of nitrogen. So I'll put about a base of blood meal. I think it's one to two pounds per 100 square feet. And then I put my plants in and if they are showing signs that they need more nitrogen, like yellowing leaves or stunted growth, I will use uh, a liquid fertilizer, a fish fertilizer. Alaska's fish fertilizer has the highest NPK that I have found, although I, you know, I haven't tried everything out, but it has a 511. That's the one that I use for my leafy greens. Root crops are a little bit different. Some of them like a lot of nitrogen, some of them like more um, phosphorus. So, um, you know, you're going to have to research which is which. Like, I think potatoes like a little bit more nitrogen, but then things like, you know, radishes like a little bit more um, potassium and phosphorus. So you're going to have to research which ones like which. Um, but if they're more of the nitrogen leaning, you treat them like the leafy crops. And if they are not, then you want to put down a base of thing like bone meal and kelp meal. That's going to help with potassium and phosphorus or phosphorus and potassium. Um, put that base down into that bed, and then you're going to feed it a more even uh, fish fertilizer. And that's when I like Neptune's Harvest. They have a particular one for like roses and flowering plants that has a good NPK for something like root crops. Then you have your fruiting plants. These are your tomatoes, your peppers, your cucumbers, your squashes. These are ones where fruit form. So for those, I like to use um, a mix of bone meal, kelp meal and then for a nitrogen because they do need a little bit of nitrogen i use chicken manure pellets or you can use um alfalfa pellets or something like that and you put that down as a base you put your plants in if they show stunted i move over to using um, neptune's harvest or epsomas epsoma has the tomato tone in a liquid form i really like that one um, or you can just use the tomato version of the Neptune's Harvest uh, fish fertilizer. That's, that's the best way to do it. Fruit trees are a little bit different. I only use granular fertilizer on fruit trees. For berry bushes like blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, mulberries, I use my berry tone from Epsoma. And for all the other fruit trees like my avocados, my peach trees, plum trees, lychee, lemons, all that stuff, I use Job's um, citrus and fruit granular fertilizer. I only do that like twice a year. True Love asked, um, do you fertilize your seedlings? So when seedlings first sprout, they have all of the stuff that they need to feed themselves. So you don't have to right at the beginning. But once they get start getting regular leaves on, so they've got their little seed leaves. Um, those are the first two leaves that you're going to see. And then they're going to sprout out more leaves above that. Those are true leaves. Um, once they start sprouting off the true leaves, you are going to have to start fertilizing them. And I like to use um, the Neptune's Harvest fish fertilizer for rows and fruiting plants because it's a little more even of an NPK that it, it seems like it helps. But if it is like a, a true, just straight leafy green seedling, I will use the Alaska fish fertilizer because it really only needs nitrogen. And then Cami asked about steady growth in her grow bag. She's had some problems with getting steady growth. And so fertilizing containers is a little bit different than fertilizing a bed. A bed holds, you know, a lot of soil. And so you can distribute out a lot of amendments and fertilizer. Whereas a container, you know, you can put a lot in there, but once it rains or once you water it, it starts flushing it almost immediately. It can't disperse it so well. So you really have to be regimented when you are doing 
container gardening and your fertilizer because not fertilizing properly is not, it's going to be really bad because the containers like they just, they don't hold on to the nutrients as well. And they don't have the pest activity that a large bed or an in-ground garden bed is going to have. So you're going to have to get on a regimen. Every one to two weeks, you should be putting down a liquid fertilizer. And every three to four weeks, you should be putting down a granular. You're doing both because it does leach out a lot from watering, from rain and all that stuff, it leaches out a ton of the nutrients. I have found that a container garden just has to be fed a lot. Now, if you compost in place like we were talking about earlier, I have noticed that that has decreased the amount I've had to do. I usually only do uh, a liquid and a granular fertilizer once a month in that case, but I still do both and I still have to do it monthly. Whereas sometimes in the garden, I could go months without you know, putting down any fertilizer because the plants look great. After the I put down the amendments, they look great. But containers are not the same. So get a little reminder on your phone and that way you won't forget that you need to fertilize them. So I think that answers all of our questions around cultivation. I hope that that helps you be able to get your plants to produce. We have some upcoming videos with the remainder of the questions. We're gonna be talking about vegetables and harvesting next. After that, we're going to be talking about fruit trees. And after that, we're going to be talking about preserving and storage of our harvest. I hope you've enjoyed spending time with me today and answering all these questions. Thanks so much, guys. Happy gardening.